Good morning. I'm going to take a break from shoveling the world, let my fingers warm up a little bit. One of these years, mark my words, McGee, I'm actually going to buy winter gloves at our winter gloves. I've been using my motorcycle gloves all, all morning, and they are not made for zero degree weather or whatever it happens to be right now. Anyway, first of all, impossible brave. You owe it to yourself to look up on YouTube after this how to make an impossible braid because I did. I made an impossible braid and I put it around the rim of this this quiver. It's French, quiver. And you can see how I ended it. I just took the two rounded things and glued one right on top of the other. I'm also going to make an impossible braid possibly out of deer skin so it'll be kind of a a, a browner and not blacker thing for the strap. I have something in here. I need to take this out. Next of all, I'm going through the whole process here. I wound up leveling <clears throat> the belly of the bow because of the, the massy finish I applied. It was, it was bad, but then it's like, I'm going to make this as good as possible. So I leveled it off, 120 grit. And then made another wash of the stuff, acetone and epoxy, and put another coat on. I might level it again a little bit because it's not a thick coat. Put a third one on, then I will. And I'll let you know the results. Take steel wool and remove the dull, or remove the sheen. I don't know if I can get this. The sheen showing here, but it's very glassy-like, which in some respects I like, but I am curious whether or not I can get that sheen. I also was very careful taking a, a, a latex glove and latex glove, cutting strips out of it, and putting it over the fuzz, and uh, and did the back a second coat too. Why not? I want to see if I can just soak this thing in water and and have it come out okay. The the massy finish. I'm I'm really enjoying this. Not natural by any means, but you know if you're using a sinew bow and a Sinew back to bow, sinew in a wet environment, hey, maybe it's a shot. Plus, Darius White asked me in a previous video, will the Massey finish crack on the back? I'm going to see. I want to be able to answer that, so I'm also putting it on the back. Okay, as far as the, the question, I had a question from Grizzly John. How do I put, how do I make the handle? Well, this one is simply, for some weird happenstance, the strips of deer hide they have two colors on them. That's just one strip wrapped around there, but it was an old one, however old this bow was. I took it off and then rewrapped it, not trying to get it perfectly the way it was before, and then maybe the sunlight bleached out the exposed layer and kept the other side brown. I don't know, but it's, it's really kind of cool. There's no finish on that. That's just deer hide and hand oil. Now, as far as the fur, don't use rabbit. Rabbit is not um, strong enough. It's too delicate to, to last long. The hair will come out and stuff like that. It's just very, very delicate fur. And this is going to get handled a lot. So this, I believe, is some form of weaseloid life. Now, as far as how do you cut this? See that shape right there? This works out so that splice will give it not a butt joint, but a kind of a splicey joint. This is how I cut it. This is the shape with these angles here. Note, don't cut it too short. And so it's best to, to estimate how long you want it and then mark it with your thumbnail or whatever, make an impression, cut it, and then keep slicing it down until it works without having to stretch it. It just looks better if you don't stretch it. And then it's simply with that splice on the belly side, just glue it down, being careful not to glue the fur to the bow. And so you're going to have to do some of this stuff and cajoling it. That's our vocab word for today. Just so you don't glue the fur to the bow. If you glue some errant fur strands to the bow, it's not going to ruin it. But that is the shape right there. Next up, and then I'm going to get into some really cool show and tell, is that you notice relatively level 
very, very minor string follow. And if I just set this in the corner, that sinew is going to return to its normal length, stretching it back. It's going to go back into reflex. And so I'm looking at this short bow, which by my standards has a relatively, relatively tight bend radius given given the brace height and then I'm yanking it back to a great degree probably half of the total length tip to tip and still this is an amazing springy bow that I want to flight shoot because it's fast and I am thinking as I do occasionally I want to offer a half limb template for this bow I know a lot of you already make bows but you may be fascinated by proportions and for some reason I, I hit the mark on this one. The proportions are wonderful. This is a beautiful bow. It's springy. Even given red oak, very extremely low string follow given the relative abuse that this thing suffers as far as compression and, and tension. It needs to be sinew backed. You can certainly make this bow self bow, but you're really going to see it shine when it's sinew backed. And so I'm going to offer a template, half, half limb and also a template for the bending form because I want this thing to be reproduced. This is, this is worth it for the, the tips and then possibly, most likely, cross sections. So you get some idea of the, the lenticular shape of the back. It's, it's very thin, but for some reason this thing hits all the marks as far as bowability. I want to save this design for posterity. Okay, so there we have it. I'm also going to I'm going to put one more coat of of massy finish on this thing, and then I'm going to see what happens when I hit it with steel wool. Will it dull it? Will it give it a nice dull finish? And also test it over time to answer Darius White's question: Will the bat crack? To see if the bat cracks. I suspect not. Again, don't use a massy finish on a rawhide backing. It's going to soak in and make it brittle. The sinew is nature's fiber gla fiberglass, and so that it can withstand the tormenting pressures of the massy finish. Okay, now on to show and tell. This is a box. It chronicalizes the amount of money I spent on viola strings. Look at this. This is a like a hundred and something dollar C string, but that's not what we're concerned about. I have in these little baggies, actual, some of them are, are modern made, but I'm not gonna take them out of the bag and show these things. Modern made arrowheads and a combination of older ones. This, when I bought it on eBay, that it has faded where it was found and what kind of does, was marked at an arrowhead, but I'm, Pretty sure it was a dart point. Uh, this one, Big Sandy River, definitely is a dart point. It predates bows and arrows by a long time. But I also have what are probably some arrowheads in here. I'm gonna, I am gonna pull one of these things out because I want to contrast an actual reel. What's the perfect arrowhead? The arrowhead that works to a beautiful modern version. Although. You know, it's basically just a triangle with side notches in it. But let's contrast it with some West Coasty styles that were produced, and I'm going to hold this up. Hopefully, that. This is Cody's Stones and Bones Primitive Arts. Stones and Bones Primitive Arts. I also have an arrowhead made by um, my buddy Warpath Archery. And then this is also Reproduction Trade Point, which I am keeping because I want to reproduce the reproductions, which are reproductions of actual ones. Let's get in here. Now I want you to admire this. This is made by Cody. Let's see what's Cody's last name. Cody Stemler. Sorry, Cody. I kind of blanked out and but look at the notches on that thing Cody does amazing work number two Cody I'm 
putting it there. Another, I'm looking at those notches and it's like, Cody, Cody dude, you make impossible notches. This is, I'm going to jump now. This is made by Warpath. This thing is incredibly sharp. Just like the, the basil kind of a thing, which works. Incredibly sharp. Get a close-up of that thing. Look at that Warpath. Gee, man, you do work. Okay, now this is... Doo -doo -doo -doo. This is another Cody arrowhead. Compared in size to this. And so if... If you're making a reproduction Ishii set, Ishii was the man as far as arrowheads, and you need reproduction Ishii points, Cody Stemler of Stones and Bones. Isn't this thing freaking amazing? And look how, where is the cam? Look how delicate that work is. I'm not putting these things on an arrow to be used, you know. I'm gonna go with these little things. So I, I don't mind so much, even though those are actual um, arrowheads made by actual arrowhead makers that lived long, long ago. They're not as delicate. And I wouldn't be as heart sick if I just busted one of those things, even though they're actually authentic, as I would be if I busted one of Cody's arrowheads. Now, as far as one-shot deals, you're, you're actually hunting you know, and you want to make sure you've got a one humdinger, pardon my French, of an arrowhead, arrow point. Both Cody's and G's arrowheads are going to guarantee if you hit the right spot, they are going to do wicked things to whatever you shoot. And so in that way, the, uh, the expenditure of time and skill would matter for a single shot. So how much meat can you get off a single deer? You know, a doe, if it's if she's not a huge doe, maybe 40 pounds, 40, 50 pounds. That's <clears throat> not a lot compared to a lot of moose meat, a lot of elk meat, but that's, that's a lot of meat. 30, 40 pounds is a substantial amount of meat that'll keep you going for a while. That is my story. I am sticking to it. You will remember. You will remember the name Warpath Archery. And you will remember, because G will make arrowheads for you if you want them. You will remember the name Cody Stemmler. Cody, Cody Stemmler. You will remember how to do the fur on that. I would have put it on the end, but it gets, it gets abused by the string, especially if you're tying on a sinew string. And you will remember that you shall learn how to make an impossible braid impossible impossible, impossible braid all right my fingers are warm enough to go back out there and continue shoveling the world have a good one. Oh, and btw we all know the names billy burger clay hayes ryan gill but i also want to implant along with cody cody stemler's name and, and g of warpath archery I want to impart the name Red Dragon, R-Y-D, Dragon with a, a Y. Red, I give you credit. You are not necessarily in the business of, this is how you make a bow, this is how I did it, but you're keeping the knowledge alive with your incredible amount of research, your diligence, and your hard work concerning the history of bows and arrows, and that's what we're about. I just watched another one of Red's um, videos today on considering Inuit archery. And then I, I this one I'm going to have to look up. It's a fellow, he's in Europe, that's like a mad scientist in making explosives. I mean, it's fun. He's, he's, he made things that can blow stumps up out of power drinks. But he's also engaged himself in sinew-backed, uh, pine and spruce bows, old European stuff, because we know that during the Ice Age and other periods of time in Europe when it was much colder, they didn't have the hardwoods to work with, so they used the impulse woods of conifers. That's a fact, Jack, and it wasn't all you or me. That's a joke. Very small one. Anyway, 
They have a good one? 